So when I'm looking to set up a more dynamic uh, photograph of a dancer or any subject, in fact, I'm usually going to be working with my studio lighting or speed lights from behind the subject or from above. Um, in this film, we're going to be looking at the placement of the uh, lights to kind of guarantee the results. Um, I, I know some people don't like to talk about light recipes or, or kind of um, the clock and compass kind of I talk about all the time, but I think it's a really good idea, especially when you're getting started with your studio lighting, that you understand some of the fundamental kind of positioning of the light so you can pretty much guarantee results time and time again. And, and that's really as a kind of a commercially trained photographer in my youth, as it were, coming through to the port uh, the portrait photographer uh, of my latter years, uh, you kind of where you understand where you can guarantee to get results instantly. That's really what we're trying to achieve. So really what we're going to be doing is looking at the one light first, which is what we're looking at here. And this is a simple light, which is coming from a, gri uh, a gridded light above and just slide slightly behind the subject so we can minimize pretty much any shadow information on the front of the body. We'll show you the lights in position now. Um, and then in the um, next image, um, this is where we add um, a second and a third light, in this case from behind the two o'clock and the 10 o'clock position. And this is designed to actually give us a little bit of edge lighting to separate the subject from the background. Now, when I'm photographing kind of my series, The Dancer in the Dark, as it were, where we're looking at a low key image, so in other words, a dark background, dark clo clothing, I tend to go for a, a kind of a, mo a moodier, darker lighting, um, a bit like you'd expect in a Batman movie, <laughs> you know, it's not going to be all lit from the front. Uh, that's what you're going to expect from an, an Instagram kind of selfie. So when we're trying to create more dynamic lighting, we usually use light coming in from the reverse and smaller lights or controlled lights to be doing this. So this is quite common for me to actually set up a three light uh, scenario anyway, because once that's in place, um, I can then revert to even, you know, the classic kind of simple image like we've got here um, to kind of guarantee the result. And it doesn't matter if the ballerina or the dancer is going left or going right. I've got edge light lighting that can be controlled uh, as well as I can position the dancer slightly in the light from above or just in the shade of the light from above, especially when it's gridded, um, or I can switch the gridded light off from above and things really like we're going to see here. So um, when we look at the setup, um, we're looking at um, a, two lights from behind. Okay, so the strip boxes, the one on the left hand side, um, because the dancer is in what I refer to as the middle of the clock and the camera is at the six o'clock position, the light behind her on the left hand side is coming in from the two to the one o'clock position. Now it's a small gridded strip box, which means it's going to um, control its light more. Um, however, the more we point it towards the camera position, especially if we didn't have grids on, you would get more flare of the light coming in towards the lens, especially when we're wide angle. So obviously when we're using the lights of a long lens or a telephoto length of lens, depends on what camera that's, uh, that you use. Um, but when you're using a telephoto, you tend to actually um, lose everything else around and you're concentrating just on the subject. And it's only when the light is allowed to leak into where the vision of the lens is that you actually start to actually get this kind of um, flare coming into the lens. But remember, flare can be creative use as well with it. Um, however, with the dancer in the dark, we're trying to actually minimize all these things. So um, we've got that strip box coming in from the two o'clock. Uh, sorry, the 10 o'clock position. And on the right hand side, we've got the identical light coming in at a, uh, a from the two o'clock position or closer to the one o'clock position. And again, once more, they're designed to cross each other. Now, as a rule, I would tend to actually set it up where the dancer is in the middle of the cross. So if we were to actually look at their shadows on their feet, um, you would see a kind of uh, an identical kind of shadow cross as such. And if we set it up in that way, it means especially if I was using a larger set where the lights are further away, um, um, basically I would then uh, kind of make sure they're going to pinpoint, they're going to hit that middle spot no matter what I'm doing, because if, if not, 
they're going to be slightly more exposed if they were closer to the 10 o'clock light or they'd be uh, more exposed if they were kind of um, closer to the two o'clock light. Now that in its own setup is a good setup anyway because you can then control which is um, the key light as such but they will both be set on the same expo exposure. The other light we've got is up here in the top which is this um, honeycomb um, raw light as it were so there's no softening going on here and basically this is um, technically near the 12 o'clock position so in other words behind them um, but it's also 12 o'clock high it's referred to so when I usually refer to the clock and compass as 12 o'clock it would mean it's technically either on the floor and it's pointing either towards the background light or it's pointing back towards camera position. So in other words, to kind of wrap the client around the edges with that light, light lighting. In this case though, we're looking at a 12 o'clock high. So it means that this light is slightly behind her. So it only really uh, kind of lights onto the face here where she actually lifts the head upwards and backwards towards the light. So this will kind of uh, guarantee that when we kind of drop the chin down um, and the more we drop the chin down, there's gonna be less and less lighting actually onto the face itself. So that's the kind of the diagram set uh, the setup with it. Uh, and uh, pretty much you could run with all of the lighting in the same exposure if you want to. Uh, if your desired aperture is 8, 11, 16, whatever, I mean, you could pretty much set them all up the same. I would tend to work with the strip boxes at one stop less than the gridded light from above, and the gridded light from above would be my working expo exposure. So that means when I either switch um, the lights off or I move the subject away from those strip boxes, the exposure is obviously changing, but my light from above is still controlling my working exposure. If I was to switch the 12 o'clock high light in off, so in other words, no top light at all coming down, then obviously I would uh, adjust my working exposure to the strip boxes on the side. So if I was running an overhead light at say F11 and the strip boxes were F8, um, then I could revert my working exposure to F8. Um, that's going to record the, de the detail on the edges of the flesh but you could also find if you've got a, a glowing skin like from sweat or it's oiled um, that will actually burn out. Um, there is an expression in, light, in lighting that means the light from behind will appear twice as bright. We can see that in fact when the sun hits a puddle, sorry when a moon hits the puddle it increases it in Ted's T in exactly the same way as when a sun hits a puddle, it actually increases its reflectancy as well. And that is the same when it's coming off any color skin or any color of subject as well. So that is where we tend to actually uh, use an exposure less than what it would be metered for. So when we meter as a rule, if we could see where the clock hands um, kind of um, stopped uh, in the middle of the dial, we would meter from there towards the light source, each one individually to make sure they were basically the same. And that would work the same with the 12, uh, the 12 o'clock high. And then obviously set, setting them equally distance apart with the same accessory and the same exposure coming off them if we wanted pure symmetry. But don't, but don't be afraid if you've only got like a, a honeycomb uh, or gridded softbox on one side and a softbox on another, then all, all you've got to do is make sure that you meter them individually um, with the other one switched off, yes, um, so that you can get a work and exposure to match each other. Because remember, if something's got a grid on the front, it's going to hide a lot more light. If something's got two layers of diffusion on a softbox, it's going to lose a lot more light than a light with one layer of diffusion. That's why we meter them. So when we look at the light from above, and that is the only light. So even though you're seeing the strip box in the two o'clock position here, that is just the modeling bulb and it's adding nothing to the exposure at all, okay? Um, but the light from above here, the gridded light, you can see what it's kind of giving us. It's giving us this pure, almost downward shadow, um, but it is coming slightly back towards the camera position uh, because of where it is positioned, yet yeah, coming from slightly behind her. But that's where we get our working exposure. 
when we kind of move her slight, slightly in and out of the light, we need to know the tolerance. Because if we've got a very, very small light source and we basically don't get the, uh, the, sub, uh, the subject to hit that spot each time, the exposure is not going to work, especially when you're working with small gridded lights and things. So this shows the um, effect of just the 10 o'clock light uh, coming through. Again, remember, remember you can see it's gridded uh, here. Yes, and the exposure is softened as well. The light is softened. Um, there is some kind of flare blooming going on, but it's not a lot. But this is metered in exactly the same way as the other light source when it's coming in from the right-hand side. Now, one of the great things about working with the likes of a lighting system where you can switch off each of the lights individually, it means that you can quickly control your lighting and studio space without having to run over to the light and switch it off and so on with it. In this case, I'm using Elinchrom system, um, studio flash, uh, ELBs, and these are the ones that kind of allow me to kind of uh, trigger them or not trigger them in the setup. But I can work the same way with my speed lights as well, of course. So this is showing the 2 o'clock and the 10 o'clock light going off. Um, and then you can see here all three of the lights going off, except the dancer is slightly out of the overhead light. Um, if we're looking onto the floor, we can see where it's kind of got the illumination. There's no real shadow caused from the light from above. So that means she's slightly out of the, the perfect sweet spot of where we set up up to. If we look at the next Im image, you can see the shadow more now, and she's in the right place for this uh, um, over the overhead 12 now. And you can see obviously where she leans back, we start to actually get the lighting actually onto the body and things. So with that in mind, you can then see how you kind of set this all up. And if you're having to work in a small space because you've only got a small black background like we set up in here, and you get a little bit of the blooming kind of going on, then don't worry too much about, about it um, because you could just go in and um, set your kind of black as black uh, would be. So if I just click onto the black here in the background, click into the middle, and then if I just hit E for Arrays, we can start to actually get away with some of the blooming. Now, th this is just the quick fix, of course, yeah? I'd obviously encourage you to be uh, a little bit more precise, um, but, don't, but don't be afraid. But really what we want to do is maintain that the um, information of light, the amount of light coming onto the subject is controlled and we've got a beautiful exposure on her no matter what, okay? That's really what we're trying to control. So when we look at the skin pore and everything else, we're not burning anything out at all and we've got the full control of all the, de of the detail and that's without any real drastic changes in the likes of um, uh, Photoshop um, or in RAW and things really. So that is the kind of the setting up of my Dancer in the Dark. The one light from the overhead uh, just by itself making sure that it comes slightly from behind her above so we can even create a shadow of the face that's what I like you you might prefer a little bit of de detail on the face the alternative then is to add the uh, strip boxes for separation and remember that's what they're there to do is give edge light into the subject and give that lovely separation and um, of course in the same setup then uh, we can pretty much default to the kind of the finished image. So we have kind of work in, even though a dancer in the dark, we're actually picking out all the details and we're creating some really good images.